thank you, Pastor Cassidy and Brandon, for introducing us to our potential next uh, lay elder. Make sure that you are also giving us feedback on that and uh, just all the wonderful things that are happening here at uh, Sierra Bible Church. Uh, If you brought your Bible, please open with me to Hebrews chapter 9, the passage that was just read. If uh, you don't have a Bible, there should be one in a pew in front of you somewhere. Or if you don't have a Bible, just uh, raise your hand and let somebody know and we'll put a Bible in your hands and you can take it home and it can be your Bible from here on forward. Um, we love the scriptures here at Sierra Bible Church. We like to work through books of the Bible uh, continually so that we hear all of what God has to say and we don't skip over the parts that uh, either are confusing or um, maybe rub us the wrong way so that we can hear everything that, that God has to say. And the book of, of Hebrews is a beautiful, deep, and challenging book that I like to refer to as a spiritual Gumby. Do you remember Gumby growing up? Anybody have Gumby toys uh, when they were a kid? Uh, it's that little l- little guy that you could just stretch as far as as you wanted, and uh, you. I guess they probably could break if you had like a scissors or something, but they, they're, they're, the whole point is you could stretch it, you could stretch Gumby really far and he would always come back to a whole Gumby toy. And Hebrews is like that. It stretches us, uh, it challenges us, it, 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 it both theologically and practically stretches us in various directions, but it always does so for our good and it keeps us whole and it, it allows us to bend, uh, but hopefully not break. Uh, Today, the author of the Hebrews is going to continue his exposition uh, about the old covenant and why the new covenant is better than the old covenant. And he's going to move away from the specific uh, regulations of the old covenant or the promises of the old covenant or the, and the promises that the new covenant are, is better is going to move away from those and he's going to zero in his focus on the location of where the old covenant was administrated in the tabernacle. And he's going to describe in in, uh, detail exactly what the tabernacle's furnishings, floor plan, and regulations are. I bet you when you woke up uh, this morning, you didn't say, you know what? I wonder what the the difference is between the first and second sections of the Old Testament tabernacle. But that wasn't on the forefront of your mind. But as we study the scripture, we will see that every single word is inspired by God and is useful and profitable for us. And if we unpack it uh, clearly and intelligibly and meaningfully and we apply it to our lives, you will see the rich depths of God's wisdom as he is administrating all sorts of things for our lives. Is anyone's favorite season fall? I knew that there would be probably 25%, just regarding uh, how many seasons there are. It's one in four chance that fall is your favorite season. I knew that, and that's probably about that. A number of people, fall is the favorite season. I don't know if it's particularly my favorite season, but I love fall. I especially loved it as a kid. There was always the bummer about, okay, now I got to start school back up again. But there was also, uh, there was also the starting of sports seasons. There, there was uh, getting back together into a, a routine that was, con- that was consistent, that, w- that was consistent. And, uh, one of the most primary things that I liked about, uh, about fall, especially as a high schooler, was homecoming. I know you're you're either you're either you love homecoming as a high school student or you absolutely hated homecoming as a high school student. I'm not going to make you raise your hand to tell us which camp you were in, but I was fully in the camp that loved homecoming. I loved the parades, I loved the football games, I loved every festivity that my high school would do for uh for our school for homecoming. It was even I even I even was one of those strange guys that even liked the homecoming dance. And really, one of my favorite things was thinking through, okay, which girl am I going to ask this year? It was a challenge and the nerves and the anticipation. 
But every single year, I love thinking it through and how, okay, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. I'm going to actually ask this girl to the dance. Homecoming, at its best, displayed the glory of the school. At its best, all of the arrangements of the dance and the football games and the spirit weeks and, and the, the, the different days of dress. Oh, well, thank you. Seven dwarves. Siri, well, you're just so thankful. He, he, Siri just pulled up uh, Seven Dwarves Spirit Week. Okay, well, th- <laughs> well, thank you. Homecoming inaugurated a brand new school year. It celebrated athletic accomplishments. It was designed for, to, uh, for social activities that brought the whole student body together. Under the old covenant, what, or what the author to the Hebrews would call the first covenant, God set up a specifically designed meeting place between God and man, God and his people, that was called the tabernacle. For short, the author calls it the tent. Today, we're going to see that the tabernacle's arrangement under the old covenant and the tabernacle's regulations under the old covenant pointed forward to us to a better arrangement that has come in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would be with us now, that you would help us to open up your word so that we could see the truth that is contained herein and that you would allow for our hearts to be melted by your glory. We thank you for all that you have accomplished in and through Christ. And we pray for your grace and your mercy to be at work throughout this entire service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the author of the Hebrews opens chapter 9 with the the purpose for the Old Covenant tabernacle. Uh, he, He teases the fact that there were regulations for going to this Old Covenant tabernacle, this Old Covenant tabernacle for worship and and teases that the purpose was for holiness. Look at verse 9, or sorry, sorry, chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. This is the the broad-based summary statement for why God instituted the old covenant tabernacle, an earthly place of holiness where his holiness might dwell among his people. And there were specific prescriptions and regulations for the people to undergo in order to abide by God's holiness. But before he goes into detail of what these regulations are that he's going to pick up later in verse 6, he wants to go into detail about the specific furniture and the floor plan of the tabernacle. Because it's important that the readers understand that this wasn't willy-nilly thrown together. This was intentionally designed by God for a specific purpose that would point forward to a greater and bigger and more eternal reality. So he starts in verse 2. For a tent was prepared. A tabernacle was prepared. The first section in which there was a lamp, the lampstand. And this lampstand was a lampstand in this first section that came up and had three prongs coming out on each side and one lampstand in the middle that had seven lamps on top of the lampstand. It would be continually burning at, at every, uh, during every minute of the night as a symbol to the world that God's presence and God's light was with his people. From evening all the way until morning, this lampstand burned to symbolize and show God's presence is with his people. But that's not the only thing that was in the first section. We see there was the table and the bread of the presence. This was bread that was prepared as an offering to God that the priest would continually eat. Each and every day, the priests would feed at this table of the bread of the presence, and it was to show that God communes with his people, and that the priests that were representing the people are communing with God. This was the outer, this was the first section, and then the author gives us what it was called at the end of verse 2. 
It is called the holy place, the place where priests go to shine the light of God amongst his people and to commune with him through eating of the offerings. Chapter three, or sorry, verse three. Behind the second curtain, there was a second section. Imagine how that works out. The second section called the most holy places. Some of your translations might call it the holy of holies, the most holy place. And inside of the most holy place, there were specific symbols of God's supernatural power at work among his people. And then he gives the specific description of the furniture, the objects that are in the most holy place. Verse four, having the golden altar of incense as the high priest was to enter into the most holy place. He would always go with the burning of incense. And there was a place for the burning of incense to continue to go into the heavens. There's a golden altar of incense. And the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold. This beautiful, glorious Ark of the Covenant. And then the author to the Hebrews mentions what is inside the Ark of the Covenant, according to his understanding, in which was a golden urn holding the manna. There's this golden urn in which the manna that was given by God to the people of Israel as they were wandering in the wilderness, escaping from slavery in Egypt but before they had settled permanently in the promised land. In the golden urn was this supernatural bread from heaven, the manna that was symbolizing that God continues to provide for his people and that his people don't live by manna or bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Aaron's staff that had budded. On one occasion, Aaron's high priesthood was being challenged. And as the challengers came to say, how come you get to be the high priest? Why can't I be the high priest? God affirmed the appointing of Aaron and Aaron's descendants as the high priest by causing his staff to bud. So inside of the ark, the author of the Hebrews says there's this golden urn of manna symbolizing that God provides for his people. There is the, the ironic, not ironic, ironic, like A.A. Ron. Four of you people understood that reference. Uh, of Aaron's staff that budded, that showed that he particularly was the, the high priest appointed by God and the tablets of the covenant, the very tablets on which God's word was inscribed, placed inside the golden ark of the covenant. And as the ark of the covenant was sealed, Above it were the cherubims of glory, these beautiful golden statues of these massive angelic creatures called the cherubim, whose wings overshadowed the mercy seat, the place on which the offering, the blood offering of the bull and the goat on the day of atonement would be placed. The author of the Hebrews would call it in the new, under the new covenant, the throne of grace. And you can tell that the author of the Hebrews is a Bible nerd and that he really wants to begin explaining in detail each and every one of these important furnishings because they matter to the people of God and they should be explained clearly It's because they point to a greater heavenly reality. But he realizes he might lose some people like in some other sections. And so he just finishes out this section by just saying, that's not the point. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. But the implication from that sentence is that you should explain at some point in detail what all of these things are. Because God's word has, 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 God has placed them in his word and they are there for a specific reason so that his people might understand and comprehend his glory in a deeper, fuller, more rich sense. 
we've already seen that the God's purpose for the earthly tent, God's purpose for the old covenant tabernacle was to have a replica in heaven. We saw earlier in Hebrews as, as, as the author to the Hebrews quoted uh, Exodus when it says that Moses designed the tabernacle according to the pattern that he had seen on the mountain. So Moses gets this vision of of the uh, of heaven and allows or, and then builds out the tabernacle in accordance with the pattern of what he sees in heaven so that the people would have a glimpse in their worship as they gathered together for worship and presented their offerings they would have a glimpse and an understanding of what it means to approach a holy god and that God himself would be preparing them for eternal realities of what it's like to be an image bearer of God living with him forever. Now, I served here as a pastor for just over five years, five and a half years. The church context that we were called away from to come and serve uh, this church was very similar. Similar numbers, similar age, age demographic. Um, the, the staff pastors that I worked with, though, were much nicer than these. <laughs> Teasing. <laughs> Renee is not even here to defend himself. So <laughs> Teasing Glenn and, uh, and Cassidy. Uh, but it was a very similar dynamic. Similar demographic, similar, uh, similar, con similar context, similar background of, uh, of desiring for the, the glory of God to be seen and proclaimed through the, through the word of God. But when I was serving as a pastor in that context, I think I did about three to four weddings for every one funeral we did. Since I've been here, it's been reversed. I think I've done three or four funerals for every wedding. And it's not because of demographics. It's not even because of the pandemic. It's just this is simply the season that God has appointed for our church to walk through. And of the last four memorial services that, that, that I before that I officiated here for our church. Tom Stone, Carl Willman, Stanton Gillen, Dave Billhartz. All within the last year. You know what the common thread among each and every one of those is? As they were approaching death and they were thinking through the things of what it means to die well, you know what each and every one of them had? A deep and abiding love and joy when they thought of heaven. When they thought of the eternal realities that are theirs in Christ. They loved to each and every one of them to fill their minds with thoughts about the eternal. Brothers and sisters, this is why God gives us in his word the dimensions of the tabernacle. This is why in great detail, he, God outlines for us in the book of Revelation all of these vivid pictures of the eternal realities. Because they're all built on images from the Old Testament and ushering into the New Testament. And they encourage us and prepare us so that when we do face that fateful day of meeting God himself at the end of this earthly life, we are prepared for the heavenly and eternal reality with joy. Brothers and sisters, I hope and I pray you never get bored with these types of details of the scriptures. I hope and I pray that as we're explaining these things, like the cherubim of glory overseeing the mercy seat, the golden urn that's filled with the manna, the, the staff of Aaron, uh, of Aaron that, that budded, I hope and pray that you are able to see with the eyes of your spirit how these give us a picture and a window into the spirit spiritual reality that will last forever. 
And I pray, I pray that each and every one of us, that God would give us a hunger and a desire for his word so that these things don't just spiritually wash over our eyes and say, okay, get to the good stuff, like the forgiveness of sin. Like, this is the good stuff. It all points to the forgiveness of sin. It shows you how the forgiveness of sin is made possible. And it shows you the beauty of how God prepared the way for his perfect son to come as a sacrifice of atonement for you and for me that makes it not just possible to come to approach him in eternal glory, but it makes it permanent between you and God. I pray that we as a church never get bored with these eternal realities. The purpose of the furniture and the floor plan was to proclaim to a people, this is who God is and show them a window into the eternal realities that he was preparing for Christ to come into. But this eternal, these eternal realities that are foreshadowed, that are teased in the old covenant tabernacle, they also had a list of regulations for how you are to approach God. Because if you want to approach a holy God, you have to approach a holy God his way. We can't approach a holy God just in whatever way we desire. We must approach God in the way that he desires. And it is a gift of his grace to be able to instruct us with the regulations for how he would be approached. And, and so the author to the Hebrews outlines the most pertinent ones that the New Testament Christians are supposed to understand. Verse 6. These preparations having thus been made. So outlining the furniture, outlining the floor plan, all of these preparations having once been made. The priests regularly go into the first section. First section with the lamp stand and the table and the, pre and the bread of the presence. Priests would regularly go into there, daily go into there, performing their ritual duties, making sure that the lamp stand was lit at all times, eating of the, the bread that was offered to God, symbolizing our commun er, their communion with him in the tabernacle. Continually. Verse 7. But into the second, only the high priest goes. In the line of Aaron. Only the high priest goes. And he, but once a year on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, who, the, the day in the Jewish calendar that we had just passed earlier this week. He goes, but once a year and not without taking blood. The author of the Hebrews wants to zone, zero in on access to the Holy of Holies. Access to the most holy place is limited. Only the high priest is able to go there. And it's temporary. He can only go in once a day. And it's exclusive. He can only go in offering blood, a blood with a blood offering for both himself and and for the unintentional sins of the people. The, the whole point is that the author of the Hebrews is communicating is that access to the Holy of Holies under the Old Covenant and the Old Tabernacle is not, is not free and full and, and permanent. It's limited and exclusive. But then, in verse 8, the author of the Hebrews has a revelation from God, an insight into why God designed it this way in light of the coming of Christ, in light of what Christ has done in his death and his, in his resurrection. He receives, a, he receives an insight from the Holy Spirit in verse, in verse 8. By this, this arrangement of the first section and the second section, the, most, the holy place, the most holy place, the necessity of the, of the high priest to only go in once a year. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for this present age. What in the world does he mean by this? 
What I think he is trying to communicate here is that as long as this world is infected with sin, as long as you live in this, this age of sin and death, in which sin and death occur, access to the holy of holies and the full presence of God is limited to only a high priest who has gone before you. And praise be to God, we have that access to our high priest in the Holy of Holies, Jesus Christ. But in the overlap of these ages, the age where the sin and death is, is, is coming to an end, and the inauguration of the new age in which Christ has ushered in by his death and his resurrection and the pouring out of his spirit, one day the age, one day the fullness of the age of sin and death will be wiped away forever and the full presence of God will be present with his people forever. And he shares this all to show the insufficiency of trying to approach God in and of your own strength under the regulations of anything that is in this particular world. And this is where he closes in verse nine, the second half of verse nine and verse 10. According to this arrangement, Gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So under the arrangement of the first, uh, under the arrangement of the old covenant, you can offer blood of, of the bulls and the goats. You can do your ceremonial washings. You can approach God and you can worship him in holiness, but all of the offerings and the sacrifices are temporary and you have to continue to go again. So it only cleanses, it only cleanses for a temporary time. It cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Verse 10, but only deal with with various food and drinks and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation, the time in which Christ were to come and perfect the conscience of the worshiper forever and permanently as he will glory in next week, starting in verse 11. Getting prepared for homecoming was great. I enjoyed it. Ladies, they'd purchase a new dress. They'd put on their makeup, go to the hair salon, get their hair done. They'd get all the input from their friends. Oh, that looks good on you. That doesn't look good on you. What accessories are the best to wear? What, what jewelry, what, what jewelry is, is the best? They get all prepared to go. The guys actually put on a shirt and tie and maybe wore some cologne and maybe put on deodorant. Yet, no high school guy who brings a girl on a date to homecoming proposes. It's not what it was designed for. Nothing is permanent in a high school homecoming. You just have to do it again next year, and hopefully they graduate. At best, at best, it's practice, not a permanent commitment. At best, the guy learns how to treat a girl like a man, how to be responsible and respectful and gentle and kind. At best, a, a lady learns how to be dignified and upright and confident and beautiful. The date might be wonderful, it might be a, a wonderful time, but it's limited. It's not meant to have permanent efficacy. Brothers and sisters, in order to meet with God fully, in order to, to make it permanent between you and him, we can't just wash over the external on Sunday mornings. We need a total cleansing of our lives from the stain of sin. From the inside out, the insufficiency of the old covenant worship is a point is points forward to us to show us that nothing in this world can cleanse us from the stain of sin. Nothing. I, I don't care how much you work out. It's not going to solve your gluttony problem just by exercise. I don't care how many regulations you put on your phone to make sure that you don't go on to those sites. That's not going to solve your lust problem. 
I don't care how much you discipline yourself to say, you know what? I'm going to get to work early. I'm going to stay late. It's not, that's not going to solve your laziness problem. The whole point of the old covenant tabernacle and the external washings is saying that everything that this world offers to try to help you become holy before God is insufficient and temporary. You need a greater sacrifice. You need a more permanent high priest. You need one who will be on your behalf as the focal point meeting before meeting between God and man who will never be removed. You need a high priest whose name is Jesus, who is the better tabernacle, the better meeting place between God and man. And this means three things for us this morning. First, the only way for you right now, as I'm speaking, as I'm preaching, as you're reading the word, the only way for you to enjoy the full presence of God spiritually right now is through Jesus and him alone. He's the only high priest who can offer us a blood sacrifice on behalf of his people that God will accept. And he will say to his people, because of that sacrifice, on the basis of your high priest's work, you are cleansed permanently. Which means... The only way to enjoy the full presence of God right now is through Jesus, number one. Number two, the second thing that this means for you and for me, the only way to enjoy a clean conscience before God and before others is to grow in Christ with his church. It's the only way. You can say, well, no, I just need me and Jesus. Well, yes, you do just need you and Jesus, but you're going to avoid things that Jesus is pointing out in you aren't you? Yes, you are. You little thieves and liars that are here, hiding your sin. But you know who you can't hide it from? The body of Christ and the Holy Spirit at work inside of the body of Christ and inside of, the, inside of his church. This is why Pastor Glenn this morning gave us a corporate confession of sin. Because we, when we gather together, we can't run from the presence of God. And therefore, we must offer our, our sins to God uh, and confess them before him to allow for the permanent sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf to be applied to our lives in our corporate gatherings. And you know what that does for us in our corporate gatherings? It gives us freedom. It gives us freedom to boldly confess anything that we have done to God or to one another so that we might grow. That that failure is not permanent. You know what's permanent? God's forgiveness. The only way to enjoy a clean conscience is to grow in Christ with your brothers and sisters in Christ, with others. And thirdly, what this teaches us is the only way that this dirty world that is plagued by sin and death in this present age the only way that this dirty world that is plagued with the stain of sin, the only way for this world to be cleansed is if his church, you and me, if we share Christ with this world. The blessing of a clean conscience is not limited to a specific geographic location like it was under the tabernacle. There's only one place you can go for the forgiveness of sin. And that forgiveness of sin was temporary under the old, under the old tabernacle. Now that it's been made permanent in Christ's offering, and because he's raised from the dead and his spirit has been poured out upon this, uh, upon his church, his church can go to every corner of the world and say, be cleansed of your sin. Be free from your bondage. Know that there is a God in heaven who loves you and a high priest who represents you that will forgive your sin and you can be with him forever. This spiritual reality can be applied to any person on the planet. We should expect when we gather together to grow in Christ, we should expect for us to be confessing of our sin 
and to live in freedom. But also, we should expect as we proclaim the gospel, as we share Christ with other people, that the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin. And they will say, what you say is true of me. I am a sinner. I am a liar. I am full of lust and greed and all of these things. God's word is, con- is convicting me in real time as, I, as, as we're hearing these things. And we should expect people to say, I need a savior. I need someone to cleanse the permanent stains on my soul with a permanent forgiveness. And we should expect people to respond to the gracious invitation of God to be cleansed of their sin and to walk rightly with him. We should expect for God to be glorified as we share Christ with this world. If you are here in this congregation here this morning, if you kind of muttered through the confession of sin, if maybe you were dragged here by by someone uh, that you know knows Jesus, but you yourself don't know him, if you see these rituals that we do of singing songs and hearing the Bible proclaimed, and this is all just a bunch of religious stuff, know today that you can have your life changed by the grace of God, by the mercy of Jesus, through the cleansing forgiveness that he offers because of his sacrifice, and your life can be changed today. If that is you, you can be right with him today and have your soul cleansed. Speak with a pastor, speak with myself, speak with someone who can help walk you through what it means to have a clean and clear conscience before God. If you already, if you've been fully participating in everything that we've been doing today and you confessed your sins corporately to, and, and you meant the words that were on the screen that, that Pastor Glenn led us through, <laughs> celebrate. Enjoy the forgiveness that God has given to you. You're right with him. Your soul is cleansed. You can know him. You can grow in him. You can share him with the world. And you can walk rightly before God and others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the mercy that you have poured out upon us through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Thank you that we get to see it in graphic detail in the book of Hebrews, exactly what you came to fulfill in the insufficiencies of the old and the ushering in of the new. God, we ask you and we pray that you would help us to fix our eyes and our minds upon you. God, that you would allow for us to enjoy the blessings of knowing that we have access to the full presence of God spiritually right now through Christ. God, I I pray that we would be a people of clean conscience. God, who, who freely confess of our sins to you, God, first and foremost, and to one another, so that we can hear the words of the gospel, the the blessings of the forgiveness of sin from the lips of other people to us that, that come straight from heaven. God, and I I pray you would empower us because we're cleansed, because we're free, because we have a merciful and faithful high priest who's always there for us in our time of need. God, I pray that you would embolden us to share this love and this mercy with the world who desperately needs you. God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to walk freely and cleanly before you, not because of anything that we've done, but because of your son and what he has done on our behalf. We love you and praise you, and we thank you that your mercy is more. Amen.